please take a moment to hit those like and subscribe buttons. While a small gesture, it really means a lot to Wild 7 Studios and allows us to continue creating meaningful and fun content for your listening and viewing pleasure. You're listening to the Wild 7 Podcast Network. Listen different. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Because men groping in the Arctic darkness had found a yellow metal. I expected this reception. All men hate the wretched. If I loved you less, I might be able to talk about it more. Lord, I thought we were through with those Martians. You are now listening to Storyscapes on the Wild 7 Podcast Network. The Luck of Roaring Camp by Bret Hart Performed by Alex Rogers There was a commotion in Roaring Camp. It could not have been a fight for an 1850, that was not novel enough to have called together the entire settlement. The ditches and claims were not only deserted, but Tuttle's grocery had contributed its gamblers who, it will be remembered, calmly continued their game the day that French Pete and Kanaka Joe shot each other to death over the bar in the front room. The whole camp was collected before a rude cabin on the outer edge of the clearing. Conversation was carried on in a low tone, but the name of a woman was frequently repeated. It was a name familiar enough in the camp. Cherokee Sal. Perhaps the less said of her, the better. She was a coarse, and it is to be feared, a very sinful woman. But at that time, she was the only woman in Roaring Camp, and was just then lying in sore extremity, when she most needed the ministration of her own sex. Dissolute, abandoned, and irreclaimable, she was suffering a martyrdom hard enough to bear, even when veiled by sympathizing womanhood, but now terrible in her loneliness. The primal curse had come to her in that original isolation which must have made the punishment of the first transgression so dreadful. It was perhaps part of the expiation of her sin that, at a moment when she most lacked her sex's intuitive tenderness and care, she met only the half-contemptuous faces of her masculine associates. Yet a few of the spectators were, I think, touched by her sufferings. Sandy Tipton thought it was rough on Sal, and in the contemplation of her condition, for a moment rose superior to the fact that he had an ace and two bowers in his sleeve. It will be seen also that the situation was novel. Deaths were by no means uncommon in Roaring Camp, but a birth was a new thing. People had been dismissed from the camp, effectively, finally, and with no possibility of return. But this was the first time that anybody had been introduced ab initio, hence the excitement. You go in there, Stumpy, said a prominent citizen known as Kentuck, addressing one of the loungers. Go in there and see what you can do. 
you've had experience in them things. Perhaps there was a fitness in the selection. Stumpy, in other climbs, had been the putative head of two families. In fact, it was owing to some legal informality in these proceedings that Roaring Camp, a city of refuge, was indebted to his company. The crowd approved the choice, and Stumpy was wise enough to bow to the majority. The door closed on the extempore surgeon and midwife, and Roaring Camp sat outside, smoked its pipe, and awaited the issue. The assemblage numbered about a hundred men. One or two of these were actual fugitives from justice. Some were criminal and all were reckless. Physically, they exhibited no indication of their past lives and character. The greatest scamp had a Raphael face with a profusion of blonde hair. Oakhurst, a gambler, had the melancholy air and intellectual abstraction of a Hamlet. The coolest and most courageous man was scarcely over five feet in height with a soft voice and an embarrassed, timid manner. The term roughs applied to them was a distinction rather than a definition. Perhaps in the minor details of fingers, toes, ears, etc., the camp may have been deficient, but these slight omissions did not detract from their aggregate force. The strongest man had but three fingers on his right hand, the best shot had but one eye. Such was the physical aspect of the men that were dispersed around the cabin. The camp lay in a triangular valley between two hills and a river. The only outlet was a steep trail over the summit of a hill that faced the cabin, now illuminated by the rising moon. The suffering woman might have seen it from the rude bunk whereon she lay, seen it winding like a silver thread until it was lost in the stars above. A fire of withered pine boughs added sociably to the gathering. By degrees, the natural levity of Roaring Camp returned. Bets were freely offered and taken regarding the result. Three to five that Sal will get through with it, even that the child would survive. Side bets as to the sex and complexion of the coming stranger. In the midst of an excited discussion, an exclamation came from those nearest the door. Shh, what? And the camp stopped to listen. Above the swaying and moaning of the pines, the swift rush of the river and the crackling of the fire ah! rose a sharp, querulous cry, a cry unlike anything heard before in the camp. The pines stopped moaning, the river ceased to rush, and the fire to crackle. It seemed as if nature had stopped to listen too. The camp rose to its feet as one man, it was proposed to explode a barrel of gunpowder, but in consideration of the situation of the mother, better counsels prevailed, and only a few revolvers were discharged. For whether owing to the rude surgery of the camp or some other reason, Cherokee Sal was sinking fast. Within an hour, she had climbed, as it were, that rugged road that led to the stars, and so passed out of Roaring Camp, its sin and shame, forever. I do not think that the announcement disturbed them much, except in speculation as to the fate of the child. Can he live now? was asked of Stumpy. The answer was doubtful. The only other being of Cherokee Sal's sex and maternal condition in the settlement was an ass. 
There was some conjecture as to the fitness, but the experiment was tried. It was less problematical than the ancient treatment of Romulus and Ramus, and apparently as successful. When these details were completed, which exhausted another hour, the door was opened, and the anxious crowd of men, who had already formed themselves into a queue, entered in single file. Beside the low bunk or shelf, on which the figure of the mother was starkly outlined below the blankets, stood a pine table. On this, a candle box was placed, and within it, swathed in staring red flannel, lay the last arrival at Roaring Camp. Beside the candle box was placed a hat. Its use was soon indicated. Gentlemen, said Stumpy, with a singular mixture of authority and ex officio complacency, gentlemen will please pass in at the front door, round the table, and out at the back door. Them as wishes to contribute anything toward the orphan will find a hat handy. The first man entered with his hat on. He uncovered, however, as he looked about him, and so unconsciously set an example to the next. In such communities, good and bad actions are catching. As the procession filed in, comments were audible, criticisms addressed perhaps rather to Stumpy in the character of a showman. Is that him? Mighty small specimen. He's not more than got the color. Ain't bigger nor a derringer. The contributions were as characteristic. A silver tobacco box, a doubloon, a navy revolver, silver mounted, a gold specimen, a very beautifully embroidered lady's handkerchief from Oakhurst the gambler, a diamond breast pin, a diamond ring, suggested by the pin with the remark from the giver that he saw that pin and went two diamonds better. A slung shot, a Bible, contributor not detected, a golden spur, a silver teaspoon. The initials, I regret to say, were not the givers. A pair of surgeon's shears, a lancet, a Bank of England note for five pounds, and about two hundred dollars in loose gold and silver coin. During these proceedings, Stumpy maintained a silence as impassive as the dead on his left, a gravity as inscrutable as that of the newly born on his right. Only one incident occurred to break the monotony of the curious procession. As Kentuck bent over the candle box half curiously, the child turned and, in a spasm of pain, caught at his groping finger and held it fast for a moment. Kentuck looked foolish and embarrassed. Something like a blush tried to assert itself in his weather-beaten cheek. The damned little cuss, he said as he extricated his finger, with perhaps more tenderness and care than he might have been deemed capable of showing. He held that finger a little apart from his fellows as he went out and examined it curiously. The examination provoked the same original remark in regard to the child. In fact, he seemed to enjoy repeating it. He wrestled with my finger, he remarked to Tipton, holding up the member. The damned little cuss. It was four o'clock before the camp sought repose. A light burnt in the cabin where the watchers sat, for Stumpy did not go to bed that night, nor did Kentuck. He drank quite freely and related with great gusto his experience, invariably ending with his characteristic condemnation of the newcomer. It seemed to relieve him of any unjust implication of sentiment, and Kentuck had the weaknesses of the nobler sex. When everybody else had gone to bed, he walked down to the river and whistled reflectingly. Then he walked up the gulch past the cabin, 
still whistling with demonstrative unconcern. At a large redwood tree, he paused and retraced his steps and again passed the cabin. Halfway down to the river's bank, he again paused and then returned and knocked at the door. It was opened by Stumpy. How goes it? said Kentuck, looking past Stumpy towards the candle box. All serene, replied Stumpy. Anything up? Nothing. There was a pause, an embarrassing one, Stumpy still holding the door. Then Kentuck had recourse to his finger, which he held up to Stumpy. Wrestled with it, the damned little cuss, he said, and retired. This has been part one of The Luck of Roaring Camp. Stay tuned for part two, coming soon.